Hello, everyone, and welcome to And the Beat Goes On. Uh, my name is Arianne Harley Emerson, and I'm the Director of Music and Operations here at the Choir School of Delaware. I'm so thrilled that we are on episode nine. I can't believe that we're nine episodes in. It certainly doesn't feel like we've been in uh, quarantine this long, but alas, we have. And we are thrilled to have with us today, Dr. Jason Max Ferdinand, who is the director of the Aeolians. Welcome, thank you so much for being with us today. All right, and we also have with us um, a few other folks from the choir school, and I'll have them introduce themselves. Let's start with Nishan. Hello everyone, my name is Nishan. I've been at the choir school for about 10 years and um, I'm loving it. Awesome, and Lex? Hello, my name is Lex. I've been at the choir school for about four years now and I'm really happy to be here and be part of this family. Awesome, and Brittany? Hi, I am Brittany Stanton. I am the Director of Education and Assistant Conductor at the Choir School. Awesome. And Dr. Ferdinand, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome, 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 welcome. How are things going with you? I'm doing as best as I can. Uh, I, 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 how should I say it? Life can be so much worse right now, but I'm fine. <laughs> awesome. And everyone in your family is healthy and well? Yeah, thus far. Awesome. Thus far, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That is so good to hear. That is so good to hear. And tell us, how did you kind of finish out the semester? How did you and the Aeolians kind of pivot or what, what did the end of the semester look like for you guys? Uh, we, we, we had literally just come off a spring tour. We got back that uh, Sunday and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the pandemic kind of kicked in. So everyone kind of split. And um, so I kind of felt like my kids had done yeoman service for academic year. So I didn't, I didn't feel the need to like, you know, learn notes and learn pieces by Zoom. So we just spent time, we met periodically just to kind of talk over some things and um, to check on a recording we had just finished that, you know, just to check on everyone, see what they were doing. So we kind of spent it like that. Awesome. And tell us about the recording. What was the recording you were working on? Yeah, so uh, the, the latter half of spring tour this year, we spent some time in Atlanta, three days and did a full-fledged recording project uh, with, you know, a for real sound engineer with all this equipment and a 21-piece orchestra and recorded about 14 pieces that are, that are all dear to our hearts. And it's, it's so significant, like I said, you know, we did the recording and if we had, if we had done that recording like a week later, it would have never happened, right? Mm -hmm. So... For that reason, it just seems extra special to us because it, it, it would have never been done. And I think as I'm listening to the mixes now, I think it's going to be very, very powerful. I think people want to get their hands and ears on it. And about when will this recording be available for folks yeah. to, uh, to listen um, to? Sometime in July, or August, like um, right now, the team is kind of pushing to a June 1 deadline to get the mixes in and get all mm. the graphic and artwork in. And um, we've been busy on that on that date, but our, our publisher will kind of let us know the release date thereafter. But I'm I'm, a, I'm assuming it'll be July August. Awesome. And yeah. what repertoire is on the recording? Oh man, a whole a whole smorgage board of stuff. Um, it's kind of weird as I'm playing the mixes now. A lot of the songs kind of speak to what's happening now. Like there's a song in there called "We Remember Them," <laughs> which seems so. Uh, so pregnant with meaning right now. I remember them. There's a tune on there, smile when 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 your heart is weary. Um, that we did at ACDA. You know, so so many of the songs seem like 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 we knew what was gonna happen. It's kind of eerie, um, and we and we didn't know. No one knew, but uh, so a smorgasbord border stuff. And I think I think people will really enjoy it. I don't want to give it away too much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know. Yeah, don't give it away too much. I'm just, I cannot tell you how excited we are. Um, and to have a full album of you guys is going to be something that I'm sure that the world needs, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Yeah. The world absolutely needs it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'll be at the front of the line. So the day <laughs> that it's available, I'll be in and download, refresh, 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 refresh yeah, yeah. to yeah. make sure, make sure we get it.
I'm going to just open this up, uh, up and uh, start off with some questions from some of our student choristers here. So why don't I start with Lex? Do you have a question for Dr. Ferdinand that you would like to ask today? Okay. Um, so being uh, not only part of, but at the head of the Aeolians is like a, a big deal, I, I dare say. And um, I'm, I think it's fair to say you have quite a lot of fans. Do you remember having any particular moments, maybe after a performance or even like through a letter or an email in which somebody reached out to you and sort of changed your perspective on how your music is affecting the world? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, yes. Um, you know, we, I get letters and emails on communication like that all the time. And, um, some of them really make you have to sit down and, and think, or, or sometimes you just want to kind of cry because you realize what we do and kind of take for granted. And we do it so often that is really changing the lives and impacting someone out there that, that you just never know, be it here in the United States or, you know, some random place around the world. I get those emails and DMs a lot. And um, it's, it's very, very humbling. And it kind of makes you, um, it encourages you to kind of go on and keep doing what you're doing. You know, it gets hard sometimes, but but um, that's the impetus to keep going. So, so yes, definitely. Yeah. And Nishan, do you have a question for Dr. Ferdinand that you'd like to uh, throw out there today? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> what got you into music? Hmm. Um, short question that has a very long answer, but I'll, I'll give it a short version. Um, yes, you know, I started music from a very, very young age. Um, you know, I, I can't remember my life without it. Matter of fact, like uh, about a month or so ago, um, my friends in Trinidad were organizing a an you know, electronic birthday surprise thing for my children's choir director. Okay. So my mind goes all the way back to being in, we had a very robust children's choir when I was growing up in Trinidad. Um, so my mind goes back to that. And I, I was always singing in like, um, you know, quartets or sextet, take six it is my favorite group still to this day. So we had, you know, reiterations of our version of take six. And then I started conducting choirs. This is all like preteen, right? Um, the funny thing is though, all along in the, in the British system in Trinidad, I was, I was actually on the medical school path, um, but I was always doing music simultaneously. And um, right as I was about to, you know, make strides to get into medical school, I, I just decided that music was my passion and um, decided to switch. So if I convert that to the American system, probably say like, I guess my sophomore year, it's not a direct, you know, yeah. uh, conversion, but so kind of like sophomore year, I decided, you know what, I, I just want to go do music. So that's when I came uh, to, to school in the United States to, to finish up to finish up that. So that's kind of like the short version of that story. But it is definitely my passion. Uh, science has started becoming just you know, regurgitation of information for me. It was no fun. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right. one way or another, you still ended up a doctor. So, right. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's, that's yeah. So it worked out in the end, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Brittany, I'm going to turn to you. Do you have a question for Jason today? I do. I'm curious, uh, having been a composer and a conductor now uh, for your career, I'm wondering how those two, um, how those two interact with each other in your work those two different roles that you have? Um, well, interestingly enough, um, you know, at, at some point I never even saw myself becoming a conductor. I was actually heavy into composition, way more heavy than I am now. Now my time is so kind of divided, I, I cannot compose in spurts. Um, but I think, I think they intertwine a lot because I think having that compositional eye it always helps as a conductor because you, you see you see the music sometimes from a different lens, and I know um, for me, like people, I get this question a lot, especially by my students. Um, like I said, I sang a lot in quartets and take six is my thing, and I had like a early 
kind of informal education when it came to harmony. And because of that, I think I'm able to break down those really dense harmonic pieces. You know, I, I don't know if it's in an easier way or whatever, but it's just my way and I'm able to see it and, and kind of help teach it in a way that makes sense. So those two intertwine all the time because, you know, I have a sense of how things are made up. So even if I'm teaching something that's not my piece, I cannot look at it, look at it like that all the time. Yeah. And can you tell us um, like how, what, what was the transition like coming and studying in the United States, um, coming from Trinidad? What was that like? Um, was that very different or were you doing mostly like, what, what kind of styles were you doing in your children's choir and oh, yeah, yeah. support kind of that um, piece? And yeah. then in the United States, was it very similar or was it very different? Uh, similar and different in, in, in this context. So in Trinidad, I was doing the Royal Schools of Music, piano studies. If you look familiar with that, it's very, mm -hmm. um, I appreciated that system because it was very graded. So you kind of yes. need to, if somebody was in grade one piano, the, the skill level is kind of like here. So I was doing all of that. I did all the way to grade six practical and grade six theory. So that was great. So when I came here, actually, the only challenge was initially my, um, the music factory at Oakwood was trying to figure out what is this grade five thing? And luckily there was, and still is, uh, 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 a professor here of history is from England. <laughs> so he was able to say, this means blah, 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 blah. Um, on the singing side, my children's choir um, was kind of more church oriented, but as I came up in Trinidad, I started singing more you know, classical stuff as I got older. Um, the university they had a pretty good classical choir, chamber choir. So the transition singing wise wasn't, wasn't that difficult at all. I just kind of fell right in. Mm -hmm. I was, mm -hmm. I was psyched reading music at this point as well. So that, that was pretty simple transition. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so the piano thing was one thing and then singing just kind of, you know, joined in the band. <laughs> and I really, I, I'm a big proponent of the RSEM model. Um, like I think the Royal School of Church Music is like brilliant, like the way that, that things are kind of like graded. Yeah. Um, and I was not familiar with it before I came to the choir school. We use like a, an, an abridged version of that. Um, but I, I, for folks who are not necessarily familiar with it and are looking for kind of like a good kind of curricular or yeah. mapping and kind of idea, I, I do think that it's a good, it's a good framework, I think. Yeah, for kind it's, of a, it's a, a awesome. It's well organized and um, it's, it's awesome. I just absolutely loved it. Yeah. Awesome. Now, going to the Aeolians here, um, what? I mean, first of all, I think that you guys probably just blew everybody's mind at uh, in Kansas City in 2019. Um, I was at all of the performances that you did. Um, I went to all of them because I knew what was going to come. I, I have been following you guys for, for a long, 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 did, long, long, long did, time. Did you, you didn't stay within your track as well? No, I never stay within my track. Please don't tell anybody now that I said this, but I knew what was coming. I, I was so excited to see what was happening. I mean, because we don't see a lot of Brown choirs on ACDA stages. I mean, I can't believe that it took as long as it did for you guys to be on an ACDA stage or an HBCU to be on an, a, uh, an ACDA national convention stage. Yeah. And from my perspective, even, even, even the concert that you guys did in the church with the sacred music track, yeah. all of it just blew my mind. And it was just so wonderful to see um, such choral excellence by a uh, predominantly black and brown choir. I just absolutely loved seeing it. It was so inspirational. Um, I, I just, I will never forget that day, the day the Aeolians broke ACDA. Like it's like a, uh, it's a, it's a mile marker in my own like life because it showed so much of what an ACDA set can be. And I think it showed also a lot of just how important representation is and that it's not just representation, but it's excellent representation. It's not just bringing in a black and brown choir, but it's bringing in a, just a highly qualified, highly trained, really top-notch choir. So thank you on behalf of, you know, 
you know, black and brown children all over the world who now have that as a template to be able to see. And I also think that the ACDA set that was constructed from going from Bach to contemporary works to spirituals, again, it was just, it was stellar. I actually have the program, um, you know, and it has your hands on it, um, uh, sitting in my office because it's just like hashtag goals. Like it's just life goals. And it had a huge um, impact on us at the choir school and how we built our set um, yeah. we, uh, in Rochester this year. And so we used a very similar yeah. kind of model um, to build it. So just thank you for that. It was absolutely incredible. Um, one of the pieces that you guys sang there was um, Dale Trumbores in the middle. And I absolutely love, love, loved this piece. Um, I always love pushing the Brock Commission pieces because I always think that they're, they're always really, um, really, really poignant and they're, they really speak to our time. Uh, but what I do think about this piece particularly now is that the text is even more poignant than perhaps it was even um, uh, <laughs> when it was, you know, performed. So I'm just going to just pull up this text here um, so that folks can see this. And I'm just going to share my screen. And then we're going to listen to a recording of it. Um, and then what I want to talk about after that is the Aeolians, how you build that incredible sound. Um, I'm just so, so, so curious uh, to hear about that. So let me just pull up this text so folks can see it. And then we're going to listen to a recording of this um, awesome. as well. So this is from uh, Dale's website. This is uh, poetry by Barbara Crooker here. Um, and I'll just read it because I know not everyone will be able to see uh, this here. But the poem reads, in the middle, of a life that's as complicated as everyone else's, struggling for balance, juggling time. The mantle clock that was my grandfather's has stopped at 920. We haven't had time to get it repaired. The brass pendulum is still, the chimes don't ring. One day I look out the window, green summer, the next, the leaves have already fallen and a gray sky lowers the horizon. Our children almost grown, our parents gone. It happened so fast. Each day we must learn again how to love between morning's quick coffee and evening's slow return. Steam from a pot of soup rises mixing with the yeasty smell of baking bread. Our bodies twine and the big clock and the big black dog pushes his great head between his tail. A metronome, three, four time. We will never get there. Time is always ahead of us, running down the beach, urging us on faster, faster. But sometimes we take off our watches. Sometimes we lie in the hammock, caught between the mesh of a rope and the net of stars, suspended, tangled up in love, running out of time. And I think it's the turn at the end here that is just incredible. Um, we'll never get there. Time is always ahead of us, running down the beach, urging us faster, faster. But sometimes we take off our watches. And I think that this time that we are in right now is one of those times in which we take off our watches and lie in the hammock, caught in between the mesh of rope and the net of stars. Definitely. So I, I just absolutely think that's brilliant poetry. It's a brilliant setting by Dale here. And I want to, um, to just play a recording of you guys singing this. And wow. this is from that um, epic um, ACDA uh, performance in 2019. It was just last year. It feels much longer ago, but it was <laughs> just recently. Here we go.
So that is just, I think, just such a brilliant performance. Um, you know, Dale's there, a company, just the whole thing is just, it's just so good. Yeah. So first, um, about being an Aeolian, we're going to delve a little bit into like how that choral sound is created. So first, how often do you guys rehearse? Um, so in, in the last decade or so, we rehearse typically three times a week. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And on Friday, if we are in town from uh, 1 to 3 or 2 to 4, whichever one it is. So about six hours, give or take a week. Wow. So that's that's significant. That's yeah. that's a lot. That's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think most uh, collegian ensembles um, are, are the, some of the really like elite ones are about four hours a week, about yeah. two um, sessions of two hours each. So that's, that, that explains a lot of that yeah. there. And then, um, Nishan and Lex, do you guys have questions about what it's like, the commitment of being in the Aeolians or anything like that? Would you say, would you say it's like a lot of pressure? Cause it seems just being in this in general, putting so much work into it, so much dedication, I imagine it pays off a lot, but like, do you, do you ever have those moments where it sort of is daunting, like how intense everything you do is? Um, you know, I, I never think about it like that. No, um, I certainly, you know, pressure is what you put in yourself, right? Um, I mean, people try to put pressure on you, but you, you can decide, you know, am I going to let the pressure get to me or, 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 I'm gonna, or am I going to just have fun doing what I want to do? Um, so no, I don't think of it as pressure. I don't think my students feel the pressure of it per se. Uh, you know, man, that's a great question for them. But I don't think so. I think I think we just generally just try to have fun in doing what we do. Um, we try to make it a family atmosphere. So you know, we we don't we don't feel that pressure. Now, was ACDA pressure? ACDA was. A different type of pressure, yes, definitely. <laughs> and I, I could speak on that one for myself. It, it was good pressure in, in some sense, yeah. And what what about it was good, or what about it was different than normal? Well, I mean, for for some of the things you said earlier up in the program, um, I knew 
the historical meaning of us being there. Um, I knew the implications um, if we didn't do well. <laughs> I knew the implications if our programming was you know, a certain way. I mean, there were so many things that initially when we got accepted that I had to kind of sort through my mind very quickly and then um, started to get to work to, to make sure we didn't put ourselves into any kind of pigeonhole. So for example, mm -hmm. let me give you an example. It was very intentional that we didn't do a, like, a, um, like a Jubilee concert spiritual, like, you know, like a Joshua or Elijah Rock or something like that, because I think people go, oh, here, here comes the, you know, the brown choir singing our spiritual. So, so, so to, to uh, counter that, we did the door to my Lord with our morning, slow and contemplative. Um, so it's decisions like that, we just wanted to be sure we didn't do anything that was stereotypical. We just wanted to say, hey, here we are. And, you know, we, we can sing music. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah just music period. It, 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 it always reminds me of um, in 1999 when I was at Morgan State University and we were doing the premiere of Winter Marcellus's uh, All Rise. That's a great piece everyone should check out. The New York Philharmonic, Lincoln Center Jazz and Choir. And in the middle of one of the rehearsals, Kurt Mazur, the great classicist conductor, is conducting. And he asked uh, Winton a question. Winton was not in the orchestra. And he said, Winton, do you want this played like jazz or do you want to play like classical music? And Winton's response is something I will never forget. He said, it's all the same to me. <laughs> Meaning for him, it was just music. So let's, you know, let's play and not, not categorize that much so so yeah i follow the pressure of that to some extent yeah i i'm i can absolutely relate to that and like ooh, you know it it is it is a it and it is self-induced i suppose um because you want to do a good job nation i want to get to you do you have a question about what it's like to be an alien what the rehearsal process is like how how the sound is created <laughs> uh yeah um has there really been a song that um at it, like one of like the acda concerts that have really like connected to you and your choir you mean one of the songs that we did yeah yeah oh yeah um i well let me let me go to the back way for this question so we we try to make a deliberate attempt to make the repertoire um you know something we can live with and not just a piece we sing so on some level all of the pieces meant something to to us that's that's critical for us um if 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 you don't find a way to bring the group together in some kind of mindset like okay guys this song we're trying to we're trying to have the audience feel this emotion or we want them to get this point we we always have to have that connection for every song. So all of those songs on that set meant something uh, so significant to us from, from, from the first tune to the last tune. Um, and that's something we, we, we spent a lot of time, once we learned the notes and the music and the phrases, we spent a lot of time just talking about what we want to convey, right? So, so yeah, yeah, so all of those songs uh, was very, very special to us. And a, a question, like particularly, I loved that recording. Um, you know, in the choir world, we always are kind of the jury's out. You know, we have styles of singing that are kind of in and out at different times. And one thing that you guys do really well is you guys do this beautiful sense of vibrato, and then you guys also have nice full-bodied vibrato, even within the the piece that we have here. So, how do you create? How do you train for that? How do you create that? What, like, how do you like your yeah. sopranos? are particularly like and and the bases like uh like have this great like way of just singing beautifully without vibrato but with spin but also at the same time are able to bring the heat so how do you how do you do that well you, you know so that concept right there is um one of the reasons that i never apply to sing for acda national regional because um you know, a lot of the HBC, the HBCU tradition, the HBCU sound 
tends to be heavily uh, vibrated, if I could use that term. Um, and I started noticing, you know, 15 years ago, and I, and I said to myself, for, for my group, be it Okuda, wherever I was, for my group to become a voice in the broader choral world, that we would have to have different sounds. I realized that years ago. So coming to Okuda was a real journey, getting from where we were in 2008, in terms of the vocal production and, and, and how we um, vibrate the song, and being able to just add more uh, width to the different uh, colors we could produce. So, so what you hear right there is, is um, you, you don't know how much exciting to hear you say that about the sopranos and basses because that right there was is a 12 year journey um, to get that sense of a broad, so very, 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 very clean. Um, another example, and, 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 and it's something that we, when I say we, the aliens who was, was in the group at the time, we took, we took some flack for it, you know, you know, your, your alumni people want to hear a certain sound or the use of a certain sound, but the reality is to sing different styles very, very well, you have to adapt to the sound that's needed. Or let me give it this way. We went to a competition, when we won Choir of the World back in uh, 2017, right? This is a great example for, for those who seem to fight that thing. The first category we sang in was, I think it was called Adult Folk or something like that, whatever. And we sang some spirituals and I said, now we know um, here in America, we don't sing Negro spirituals, sense of vibrato, right? We sing that. Right. Okay, fine. So we signed our category, and it's one of those competitions where the judges come up at the end and kind of give the critique in front of everybody of all the choirs. And, and the comment for us was something like, you know, this choir is very, very talented, blah, 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 blah. But here in Europe, vibrato means that this choir is unprofessional. That's what they told us the first day of the competition, round one. The next day, when we signed the youth category, whatever, you know, more quote unquote classical stuff, we went sons of vibrato. That's just how we practiced it. One of the same judges from the day before, he saw me and he said, Oh, wow, you guys can sing without vibrato. So I chose an opportunity to say, Yeah. And the difference is the style. I said, You don't sing a Negro spiritual sons of vibrato. So for him, it was a kind of learning thing, but he was one of the judges that kind of judged us down the day before. So my point is, um, yeah, we, we, we try to make the ensemble ensemble that could do a wide range to be able to turn on, off, or sometimes we do it, you know, in one phrase, we could go back and forth so many times just to get the colors. So for us, I think that's um, something that we had to kind of learn because naturally uh, the, the black voice, you know, wants to, wants to, mm -hmm. wants to vibrate. Voice. Yeah, yeah. Like and that. and just what did you what so what the the thing about the HBCUs that I think that is also interesting is that um the 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 vibrancy like if we were to actually like have people sing through Voce Vista or whatever it is not a wobble and it's like it's also not a flutter it there's like right. a very particular right. black sounding vibrato that's a very um, it's a more even in the middle. It's not super fast, not super exactly. slow. How do you work on that? How do you, sure. what do you, what sort of exercises or how do you, how do you flex that muscle? You know, it's, 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 it's a lot of exercises, but I've learned over the years that there's an imagery thing as well. So I like, um, try to, I'm always trying to find adjectives that could kind of convey what I'm, what I'm picturing. So something like, you know, you know, pretend, pretend as a, Nice sunshiny day with no clouds, just just blue, or uh, a body of water with no waves. It's just and and for me, my ensemble was kind of oh okay, we kind of see where he's going here, and, and all of a sudden they they let then let the voice follow the imagery they have in their head, and you know the exercise and stuff followed that. I think I, I don't try to come up with the exercise first, and you know what I mean. They, mm -hmm. they have to kind of mm -hmm. be clear on what it is you're trying to say or. And a lot of listening, um, a lot of listening. Like my kids, as, as soon as they hear a certain sound, oh yeah, I think I think we can do that. And um, and then a lot of correlation too with orchestras or something I like to do. I call it orchestration. So, you know, if I if I could get them to 
imagine that string section just sends a vibrato. They, they're like, okay, I get it. And then you want to warm it up, add more vibrato. They kind of understand what that means. So within within your ensemble, you know, you have to just find ways and build that vocabulary so that the singers understand readily what it is what it is you want. And did you find it more difficult to get the sense of vibrato sounds than the the vibrato sounds? Oh, definitely, the sense of vibrato, like I said, took years. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> And, 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 you know, as I said, it took me, I don't know, 10, 11 years for me to even apply for Quora, the world competition, to apply for ACDA because I knew we could not go into those venues with just that one color. It just, mm -hmm. it just, just wasn't going to be a thing. And to get to that, I guess, was the listening a big piece of the sense of vibrato was just like listening and in, in, in the imagery. Like, how did you... How did you lean that out? It was like voicing part of it, like in kind of splitting the section out? Because I see you guys also uh, sing mixed usually. Yeah, we sing we sing mixed all the time and rehearse mixed all the time too. Um, so a, a part of that is listening, and then let, let me maybe bullet A to listening would be, um, and then convincing them that certain colors will not work with certain sounds. For example, going back to my dense harmony thing. It's really hard to hear a nice, juicy, tall chord if everybody is doing this. The chord will never set. I mean, there's no way. So, so you know what I used to do? I'll record them, having them sing it how they used to sing it, and then record it straight, and then ask them, hey, which one do you guys prefer? And all of a sudden, like, wait, we can't understand the chord in this one. You never will because everybody's doing this. Mm -hmm. So the vertical chord is never really heard and you keep going through it. So, so to get that sound, you just have to line it up and everybody just has to be straight in that moment so the chord could really lock in. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense. When you could open it up, hey, I'll let you open up all you yeah. want. <laughs> that, it's just amazing that it took a decade to to yeah. to re. It's like reprogramming. It's yeah. it's literally yeah. reprogramming. I mean, you're going against you know, it's, like you said, muscle memory and also it's... brain muscle memory because you know, you know, to think about it. If you have like I have in my choirs now kids whose parents were in the aliens which is a great thing so you have a lot of generations but think about it you grew up in your home and you you hear that color that's that's what you kind of readily want to produce that's not a bad thing mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's just um like i said to keep up with the coral world i realized that we would have to make some shifts and then that was one of them and um i'm just thankful that the singers are always malleable and and you know here we are now Mm -hmm. And uh, Brittany, uh, let me know that we've got a question from Facebook coming in. Yes. Uh, well, there's actually two I want to share with you. The first one is um, about your decision to mix singers with instrumentalists, uh, specifically on Bach. Yeah. You know, I, I get that question a whole lot. And uh, I, it would be real cool to make my answer real deep, but it's not deep at all. <laughs> um, Literally, so we, we call my office at school the war room. One of my friends dubbed it the war room and we had a big whiteboard and I wish I could show you a picture of it where, where we, I mean, we went through like an intense two months trying to find the right repertoire and you see all the times, it was, cra it was crazy. So that decision for the instruments thing was just trying to find a way to do something different I mean, that's a simple answer. And, uh, and two, it kind of works with the sound we go for anyway. We sing mixed, so you don't really hear sopranos coming from our left or basically here. And we thought, hey, why not do the same thing with the instruments? And plus on the Bach, I mean, the instruments are, are playing the exact same thing the singers are singing. So it, it works, right? And initially, um, you know, in those ACDA situations, you depending on depending on how you do it some some choirs bring their instruments list with them from you know home we hired players in kansas city so we literally met them the day before the space we rehearsed did not allow us to do the mix thing so we rehearsed with instruments in front but at the end of the rehearsal i i, I gave them a, a you know a stage diagram and i was explaining it and they were looking like what i mean one of the, a few of the players came out to me like this is not gonna work man like well i said i said just trust me i mean they were not happy but after <laughs> the 
they were like, oh my God, this was the best thing. And uh, So, you know, change. People are not used to change. Yes. So. We used that model for, uh, we did um, a BWV 142, the petite uh, Christmas cantata um, in December. And we did that. And I had the exact same experience with the players that were not happy um, no, no, but we no. did it and and we got to a place and and, and it and actually it does make a difference as a singer to experience the orchestra in that way it is just and not for, and for the players as well i mean the, the players admitted to me it was so much more fun to be able to hear the parts kind of around them and the other thing that i think is you know you are in this situation a lot like if you are really an early music person you're detailed about the articulation in the bowing and all of those sorts of things Sometimes you just need to be like, listen to how the singers do it. And you can't experience it the same way when you're playing. And I always have that, that experience like, oh, no, no. Even with the vibrato, the string attack, how long the down bow is, all of those sorts of things are just not the same. But putting them like on the risers with the choir, like it was like night and day. I want to get to the second question that you have here, Brittany, coming in from Facebook. Uh, well, it's actually a comment. And I thought maybe you would have some, um, some feedback. Uh, not all HBCUs have the talent of the Aeolians and therefore may be limiting in their programming. Thus, many do not get exposed to quote choral literature. Do you have any thoughts on uh, how to maybe make some changes in that situation? Um, I'll be interested to know who asked that. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to know. No, but um, well, the first part of the question, yes. I think, you know, here at Oakwood, Oakwood has always been filled with singers i mean years ago people used to kind of say hey you could pick any four guys at oakwood and you could have a really first class quartet well, i mean people at oakwood could really sing i i you know it's hard to explain why that is but i don't think this well skill level and the pursuit of of doing great uh repertoire i don't think should be divided <laughs> i think they kind of go hand in hand right um so I, I you know I'll use myself as the example. 2019 was the first time I taught my choirs at Oakwood any Bach, because prior to that um, I was kind of working on the various skills that would be needed to really do that successfully. So when I eventually gave it to them, you know, it was like, oh, we could do this. This is this this is fun. Um, but I think we always need to be selecting repertoire that is building skill. And, and not saying, well, I don't have the skill, let's not do that. You know, you have to find ways to, to kind of go up the ladder year by year or semester by semester, what it is. Otherwise, you know, what's, what's the point? Um, you, you have to build the program. Um, um, you, you just have to find ways to, 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 to get higher and higher and higher. And, and I get to challenge it. Universities, you know, your choir is changing every year, but your program should be rising at, at, on some level every year so you know like like for example going into this next year of uncertainty i'm already thinking that maybe my focus then will be skill building i mean more than ever you know what i mean is wouldn't be concertizing per se or, or so so finding ways to just build skill what and you could you could pick it you say this semester i'm gonna do this this semester i'm gonna do this so i think you know the level of your choir shouldn't be an excuse to uh, intentionally build the skill level so that you can eventually get there. I, that, I, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, um, you know, it's no secret. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge Bach lover. And I just one day decided that every year we're going to do a cantata. Like, I'm going to find a way to do it. Right. And I think there's just so much good repertoire and rich repertoire out there. Like you can find like the equivalent of Yankee Doodle that Bach wrote. Very simple, straightforward, and you can build um, on top of there. So I think that's like one, one thing that I think folks should keep in mind is like go to some of the great repertoire that's in the style. Uh, because first of all, style has and difficulty are, are, are different, are, are different sorts of things. So you can find something that's in the style that exactly. is um, 
at the level of pretty much any choir. I mean, Bach's got canons like that that you can that you can do, and it's all unison. And then okay, I can only do you know the first one and two, you know. So um, I think there's a lot of stuff to do there. And I'm just taking a look at the clock here, so I'm going to um, uh, pivot really quickly to talk about um, your compositional work. So I'm sure a lot of people don't know that you also compose. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, well, that composition was my first love. Um, going back to Trinidad, my friends and I would uh, almost friendly competition, see who come up with the best arrangements. So that, that was my first love. You know, life kind of, you, you, your career kind of shifts and you do different things, but I, I love composing a lot. And, um, you know, thankfully I had some stuff published by G GIA you know, some years ago, my choral triptych. I think Always Remember was my first published piece, uh, arrangement of uh, Andre Crouch is Always Remember. And then um, last, two years ago, Walton approached me to, to, to have my own choral series, which was a real kind of humbling thing. I was like, me, you want me to? So, so that, that allows me to not only uh, showcase my work, but works of people around me who you may not hear about all the time, but they do some incredible stuff like Steve Murphy, who teaches here at Meadowco, it's Cedric Dent, former member of Take Six, my friend in England, Ken Burke. So I get a chance now to showcase their music to the world, but um, composition has always been my thing. I, I don't get to do it as often now, but but you know, that's that's natural for me, I think. And um, you you mentioned um, your choral triptych, uh, which Marcus and I spoke a lot about the Ulysses K um, and that 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 beast last week. Um, if you missed that episode, definitely check it out. Um, and then you have your choral triptych, which is like a completely opposite. So we've got the Ulysses K, which is on one side. It's kind of the Daniel Pinkham. He's like the basically he's the black Daniel Pinkham. Yes, yeah. <laughs> what it is. And then um, then yours is coming through. And what is so interesting is that take six that you're talking about, like as you're talking more about kind of those harmonies and all of that, um, you know, I can really hear that as well. Um, for folks who have not done this, it's part, uh, you can look it up on GIA. It's three movements. It's really rewarding to do. It's great to pair with the K um, as well. Um, I'm just going to play the opening of the first movement, uh, which is prayer fixes things, uh, which I think is just the most absolutely, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. It sings so well. Um, and this is a recording um, that actually one of our parents took from our Black History Month concert. It's wow. very, very short. So I'll play a little bit um, of this for you here. So awesome. just give me a moment to get this up and we'll listen to Prayer Fixes Things. Here we go. We absolutely love that so much. We love it. We love it. It's so much for those um, who don't know. Uh, that was written as a warm up. It's like blows my mind. That's the best warm up. 
<laughs> maybe not a warm-up, but I remember something must have been going on um, at the time. And I walked to the rehearsal and it just kind of came to me as in response to whatever was going on with a choral member or the scratch. I don't remember the circumstance, but I, I kind of did it on the spot and thought about it wrote initially. That's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it's just the seconds are it's it it's it, talking about just pieces that build skills. That's definitely a piece that builds skills and that sense of a vibrato thing. It exactly. teaches the kind of the listening yeah. vertically. Yeah. Um, definitely, it's it's hard to do <laughs> actually. Not, uh, hard to, to piece. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not easy. It's a, it was definitely a, a a hard thing to keep in tune for sure and to hear all those chords. Um, we're um, running out of time here so we're going to get ready and and wrap up uh with our quarantine quiz um what i do want to encourage everyone to do is if we had more time i wanted to play the roland carter lift every voice and sing uh which i absolutely love and it's just i don't think it can ever be done enough um and the aliens have a fantastic recording just look up lift every voice and sing aliens it's the first thing that pops up um, and it's just wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, I absolutely love what you do with the middle section, um, kind of the free acapella section. It's just, it's just great. And how you shape um, each verse according to the text differently, particularly the Stony the Road retrod. I think it's just brilliant, um, you know, with what happens there in the Indian. So everyone should check that out. Yes, text painting is everything. Yes, it's it's just it's so great. Um, we're going to get ready and wrap up here and we're going to do our quarantine quiz. So what that is, it's a fun game that we're all going to play with you. Um, we're going to ask about silly things that you may have done over this period of self isolation. Okay. <laughs> if you've done that thing, you're just going to put your finger on your nose. We're all going to play with you. I'm going to hold up a timer. I'm just going to put 90 seconds on the clock here on my iPad. It um, is going to count down for us. And when it's all said and done, it'll reveal a picture of a duck and it'll start spinning and, and quacking and all that fun stuff to exactly. let us know that we are all out of time. So um, here we go. Whenever you're ready to read the questions, Brittany. Ready. Lost track of the days of the week. Morphed into a nocturnal being. Logged onto Zoom with business attire on the top and pajamas on the bottom. Spoken to a friend you haven't caught up with in a while. Binge watch a show in 48 hours or less. Shopped online for something you didn't need. Hid away in your room because your family was driving you nuts. Buy snacks for the week and run out a day or two after going to the store. Worked from your bed. Forgot to brush your teeth. Slept past noon. Played a board game. Did a puzzle. Cut your own hair. Baked bread, made a TikTok video, spent more time on social media than off, taken a face mask selfie, coughed and wondered, skipped a shower. And we're all <laughs> out of time. This was really, really, really uh, a pleasure to have you on the show and an honor to have you on the show. Um, I'm, I'm so looking forward to the next time we get to get together. And yeah. I know that um, right now in the works is um, what we're calling a choral cookout, where we're getting all of the uh, conductors of color together on, oh, on all on a Zoom call. And we're just going to live stream it. There's no agenda. It's just going to be a hangout session. So it's going to be a lot of fun. So I, I'll, I'll send you dates. There are a couple of dates that are rolling around for that. Uh, I want to thank Nishan and Lex, our students, for joining us today. And of course, Brittany, uh, for all of your help. And thank you for everyone um, for tuning in. And most thank you, Jason, for joining us and for your incredible work. Thank you for having me. 
our it's really 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 our pleasure um we'll be back on thursday with uh dr edith copley which i'm super excited about um and we'll see you then that's thursday at noon right here on facebook or youtube or instagram all right i'll take it easy and keep the take deep care, going everyone. on bye bye, bye. <laughs>